remain one of the top 10 wedding photographers in the world. A legend behind the lens. World-renowned author. The one. The only. Kevin Cup. We've got clients coming. Can you please go out and sweep the front of the office? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. All right. Thank you. Wouldn't it be great if you could just go back in time, maybe relive your favorite moments, do them all over again? Well, you know what, if you're shooting raw, you can literally do that. You can always go back and get the most information, get those favorite images and redo them. In fact, if you save them in DNG format, they're pretty universal. There's some really cool things you can do with the new DNG formats in Lightroom 4. Let me go show you. Well, here we are, Photo Pro and Lightroom 4 new features. This is the second part of our, our series on the new features in Lightroom 4. Now, going back in time, not completely possible, although I'm working on that. I got a little uh, project in the works, but I'll keep you posted on that. But in Lightroom, if you've been shooting raw, and this is one of the reasons why I've always advocated shooting raw in camera, is that the raw information is always there, and as new processing technologies come available, you can actually go back in time, take that original raw file that you once processed, and potentially make it better with the new processing technology. And that's exactly what's happened here. In Lightroom 4, we have great new adjustment tools that we talked about in our last episode that actually let you bring more information, pull a better quality image from the same raw file. But that only really works if you shot it raw. Now, Adobe has a format called DNG, and what we're gonna talk about today are the new features in this DNG file format. DNG is a raw format, just like your NEF or your CRW or any of the other raw formats, but DNG is sort of an open, generic form that Adobe created, but it gives you certain advantages like being able to compress the raw information. Now, that's always been available in a DNG when you convert your normal camera raw file from Canon or Nikon or other manufacturers into a DNG, you have the option to get a little bit of compression uh, without losing any information in the file. So especially if you're a Canon shooter, uh, you don't have that option in camera like the Nikons do. You could compress it, make that raw file even smaller, which of course saves on storage space. Now this new DNG format introduces a lossy compression, which is just like JPEG in that it throws some information away in order to make that file size much smaller, right? So this lossy compression is now an option you can check on or off when you're saving or creating a DNG from your raw file. Now, the cool thing about this though, is that it doesn't really throw away as much information as far as what my testing has revealed as a JPEG does. In other words, I have almost the same control over that raw file as far as being able to pull highlight detail and shadow information that I really can't do with a JPEG. I can still do that with this lossy compressed DNG file. So it's really cool in that I preserve almost all the benefits of a regular raw file, but I actually get the size of a JPEG as it would have come out of the camera. So you have a raw file the size of a JPEG. That's pretty cool. But let's talk about the differences, first of all, between a RAW and a JPEG file and why, one of the reasons why, we should shoot RAW in the first place. So here on my screen I've got two fantastic images. These are shot uh, just outside my studio here to test the ability of a RAW file and a JPEG file to preserve highlight and shadow information in a high contrast scene. Here's the image shot with a RAW file and here it is with a JPEG file. Okay, so obviously there's more information in the shadows in the raw file, but that's really not the, the bonus point here. What I want to talk about is how we can really extract a full range of information. So I'm going to start with the raw file, go to my develop mode, and I'm going to pull this a little larger so you can see here. Okay, and what I'm looking for is in this highlight information, for example, highlights on top of the car, shadows under the car, as well as up in the sky here, how much information can I actually recover in this raw file? So I'm gonna use the tools that we talked about in our last episode, bring down my highlights, okay? 
Move that slider down. Now I'm trying to get some information. And the whites. And now my sky, I'm actually getting some of that clouds. There's little white puffy clouds up there. You can see them now. There's a little streak of something airplane in the sky, but I've got blue and a smooth, cloudy, puffy texture. Let's go back down here to the car. And we can see that the highlights on the roof of the car, if I turn my warning on, all this information is there. Whereas before, it was fried. There's before, and there's after. Okay. I've also got uh, a relatively decent amount of shadow detail under the car. Now let's go to our JPEG file. Ooh, nasty look in there, isn't it? E. The JPEG inherently was not able to preserve that dynamic range. There's no detail under the car. The highlights are fried. We haven't adjusted it yet, but let's do the same thing. Pull our highlight slider down and pull the whites down. Now we're able to control this highlight somewhat shadows they're still gone there's no information here we can compare that to the raw file with much tonality much more information we have versus the jpeg you also notice that there is a uh, there's shadow tinting in the jpeg file it's blue in the shadows because it just can't register that information there let's go back up to the sky and look what happened to the sky when i pulled down my highlights and my whites the sky, instead of getting real information, it got posterized, and you can see it pretty clearly here. There's massive posterization in the sky as those subtle transitional white to blue tones happen. Uh, it doesn't have the information, so it just blocks it up. That's called posterization. So that's not gonna look very good in a print. So the JPEG inherently just doesn't have the information. Now, that's fine, because we're gonna shoot raw. Let's go back now and take a look at this raw file. Now, if we look at our metadata panel in the library mode, we can see the raw file is 13.9 megabytes. The JPEG file off the camera directly shot in JPEG high, which is what you would typically shoot in, five and a half megabytes. So it's definitely half the size of the raw file, but you lose a lot of information. You lose a lot of control and the ability to regain that lost information. So here's a new feature. Take that raw file in Lightroom, and we're going to go to Library, Convert Photo to DNG, right? In the DNG Conversion Options box, you have a couple of things. Fast Load Data, Embed Fast Load Data. This is new, and the Fast Load Data uh, is actually a very small amount of information that enables the, the raw files to load and develop sometimes up to eight times faster, they say. I haven't tested this with my stopwatch yet, but supposedly it's a lot faster to load it for a very little amount of overhead and information, maybe 200 kilobytes of extra data or something like that. So it's a very um, efficient way to speed up the loading of your images in, in the develop mode. So go ahead and turn that on. And then here's the other option, lossy compression. Lossy compression, all right? This will now convert this regular raw file to a DNG with lossy compression. Click OK. Now, here's my new compressed DNG file, and look at the size, 5.95 megabytes compared to 5.6 for the JPEG. So it's roughly the same size as a JPEG, but check this out. When we go to develop mode with this compressed raw and zoom in, I still have all of that nice tonal information of the original raw file. It doesn't look like the JPEG. And if I look in the shadows and the highlights, it looks just as good. In fact, on screen, I can't tell any difference between the compressed raw and the regular raw, and it's less than half the size. Bam! This is a great option for archiving your images. Now, one of the things I suggest that you do is to keep the original raw files. Always in my workflow, I keep the originals from the camera manufacturer in the original format, back those up that way, and then you can convert your working files, your second copy, to either the compressed raw or a normal DNG, whichever you prefer, but the compressed raw is gonna save you a ton, half the size of the original raw file, and literally almost all of the information is there to recover highlights and recover shadow information. Now in your workflow, you might be asking, how do I use this DNG? Where do I convert? How do I convert? When, why, how? 
So let's talk about how you can incorporate this DNG into your workflow if you want to do that. In your import dialog box, when you say import a file, you have this dialog box. You're probably familiar with this one already. And you choose your source for your images. So for example, I'll go into a sample job here and select the client's folder. I have all of my original images here in the original images folder. And I'll hit choose. And the images all show up. Now you can, as you import them, copy as DNG right up here at the top. See, copy as DNG. When you select copy as DNG, what happens is that Lightroom will take your raw files, convert them to DNG on the fly, and then throw them into your catalog. And you have an option to, as well, embed the preview. <clears throat> I always say standard preview, which is giving you enough information to blow up full screen and see it exactly like it will look in print. And there's also an option to make a second copy. So if you wanted to keep your original RAW in its original format, NEF for Nikon users, for example, put that on a different hard drive as you're importing, you can use this cool little option, make a second copy to. Now, when it makes a second copy, it doesn't mean to make a second copy in DNG. It makes a second copy of the original format, and the new one that it brings in is going to be DNG. You follow? So in your catalog, you'll have the DNG, but in this backup folder, you'll have the original NEF files or whatever they were in the original raw format. It's good to use a naming scheme when you import the images. That way, your backup copies, as well as the original uh, or the raw, the DNG, will be the same name. So I name them here, and I use a shoot name, and this is the job number. So this is a wedding. It'll get a wedding prefix, and a number, and a client name. And then it's followed by a number, a, pref a sequence number, which I preset via the presets here. All right, this is what it'll look like. W1234, Bogus, 001, 002, etc. And during import, I can apply a preset, which uh, we talked about in our previous episodes. If you have a favorite import preset, you can bring them in. Here's another new feature of Lightroom 4. It now groups your presets into the same folders that you use to help organize them, which makes a lot more sense than this giant list of blah, going on forever. All right, so let's look at some of our basic presets. You can load one on if you want. I'm gonna choose the Kubota default with a warm edge. And in the metadata, you can also add your copyright, which we created uh, previously. And uh, here's copyright 2012. Now, remember last season when I talked about our, our workflow with Lightroom, I showed you how to make a, a metadata copyright preset. So you can easily apply that. And if there's any keywords that you'd want to apply, you can do that as well. So you could type in wedding, um, you could type in location, whatever you need to identify with all of the images that are gonna be important. <laughs> The second copy up here, uh, make sure that you have that pointing to, with this little triangle, the folder that you want to back them up. So simply if that folder is on a server, on an external hard drive, I recommend that you always keep images on two separate hard drives, whether it's a hard drive connected to your computer and then one inside, or two separate externals. Maybe you have one on a server that's for backups and then the one on your computer is what you're working on. Whatever you work into your system, uh, put them in two different places. Because if you put your backups on the same hard drive as your working images, it doesn't really back you up much if that hard drive crashes, right? So keep them separate, keep them separated. Okay, and down below in the destination, this is gonna be the destination for the DNG files that we're importing. All right, and that will go into the client folder. The same folder that we are pulling from, we have a preset folder called Masters, DNG, and Photoshop. Again, in our first season of uh, PostPro, we talked about the workflow and setting up a template of all the folders you're gonna use so that they're always there, they're always the same and consistent. So if you haven't watched those episodes, go back, look for the first season of PostPro and learn about our entire workflow system first because it makes a big difference. All right. They're ready to import, and now we can hit import and wait for them to come in. As they're being imported, they're converted to DNG files on the fly, and the backups in the original RAWs are put in that other folder for you. So it's a nice, quick, simple way to get them in, get ready to work in the DNG format. 
Now, while this is importing, I want to make one note that this DNG, when you import it, does not apply the lossy compression that we talked about. This is the normal full quality DNG, 16 bits or 12 bits of information. It's not the lossy. The only way to get the lossy DNG is to convert it once they're in Lightroom. And I'll show you that as soon as these are imported. Great, now your images are imported. They're all DNG. And if you want to now convert them to the squished, the special half size DNG raw format, here's how you get to do it. You can select the files. You can select all of them with Command or Control A, or only a few of them if you want to. Let's just grab a few of them. I'm gonna take the first four here. And we're gonna to go to library just like we did before, convert photos to DNG. And right here, making sure we have use lossy compression. Here's another option up top that says delete originals after successful conversion. If you don't have this on, when you create this small DNG, it'll leave the original full size DNG right there next to it on your hard drive in the same folder that the original lives in right now. That's fine, but you're, you're not really saving yourself a whole lot of information that way because you're duplicating that big file. So there's no real reason to do that. We do have the original raw on the separate hard drive. Remember that? Because we did that backup. So there's really no reason why we can't go ahead and just delete this raw file right here and work from the smaller ones. Again, you may not decide that you want to throw away this information and use these smaller raw files. But uh, if you're typically a JPEG shooter and you do that because you need to save file size or you need to save card space, uh, this compressed DNG is a great option instead of JPEG. It gives you almost all the benefits of a RAW file and the size of a JPEG. So uh, if you decide to use it, do some testing first. Make sure it suits your needs. I think you're going to like it. And go ahead and choose Delete Originals. And make sure Lossy is checked here. All these other settings can be just like I have it here on my screen and hit OK. And it will convert those normal DNGs to the new compressed smaller DNG. Now one question you might ask is how do I know if I have a normal DNG or a compressed DNG? There's no real obvious uh, way to tell just by looking at the files. But if you go to the metadata for that image, I'll take this first image right here that has been converted and I look at the metadata and there's a little panel you can pop up that says DNG on your metadata. This gives you information that Lightroom is embedded about that DNG and here you can now see lossy compression, yes, it's on. If I choose a normal DNG, it'll say lossy compression, no. And that's how you know the difference between a regular DNG and a lossy one. You also notice that the file size is gonna be very different between the two. And you can see that easily by shifting here to the EXIF and IPICT. And here's 9.29 megabytes for a regular RAW file and one of my compressed RAW 5.12. So literally half the size of the regular RAW file. That's it for this episode of Photo Pro. Next week, we're gonna talk about more of the new features in Lightroom 4, but don't forget, we wanna get you guys involved. So pull up an old RAW file from back in the past reprocess it with some of these new tools, maybe save it as a compressed DNG, see if you can tell a difference. Maybe you're gonna get much better results. If you can send us a side-by-side -side of your best uh, processing that you did in the past versus what you can do with the new tools and saving that as a compressed DNG, look at the difference. If it's significant to you, go ahead and upload it and show everybody else what you're doing, okay? Thanks for participating, we'll see you again next week. Don't forget to tune in next week to Photo Pro. We're gonna talk about more new features in Lightroom 4 and specifically geotagging. Don't you wish you had a memory like an elephant? I sure wish I do, except I'm not really sure how good an elephant's memory is, but I know they're scared of mice, which I'm not. So I guess that puts me one step above an elephant. Anyway, I digress. Geotagging your photos and other cool things you can do with Lightroom 4 in the next episode of Photo Pro. See you next week. Photo Pro was brought to you by White House Custom Color. Like the music? Special thanks to Triple Scoop Music. Frame Network giveaways are brought to you by B&H. Head to giveaways.framenetwork.com for your chance to win. Find out more about the equipment used in this episode on framenetwork.com.